Welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and today we have another board game comparison. Today I'm going to be comparing these two games here, Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. Both of these games are a Lovecraftian themed dungeon crawl style board game from Fantasy Flight's Arkham Horror File Lines of Games. As a matter of fact, Arkham Horror 2nd Edition was the first game in this line of games, and Eldritch Horror has long been considered its successor because Arkham Horror 2nd Edition has been out of print. Now, just recently, a few years ago, they released Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, uh, which is a re-implementation of the original 2nd Edition. Now, today I'm going to go through and make a very thorough comparison. I'm going to unbox these Boxes, show you the components, describe different mechanisms and objectives of the game, tell you how the games contrast and differ from one another, how they are similar to one another, and also finally give some final thoughts as to what I think about these games, which ones, uh, which game does what better, in which area does one game prevail over the other, and ultimately which game I would have to choose from among the two. But for now, let's just start with the boxes here and the cover art. And this is both really, really good uh, cover art. I am slightly leaning towards the Arkham Horror 2nd Edition as far as the cover art. Uh, just feels a little bit more... Um, appropriate to the setting i like the color schemes and what have you but the art on eldritch horror is excellent as well so let's unbox these uh, open up these lids here and <clears throat> see what we have inside so both of the games here come with rule books the eldritch horror has a smaller rule book than the arkham horror uh rule book but part of the reason why is not only is arkham horror a little bit more uh, heavy and complex and not only is Eldritch Horror a little bit more streamlined but Eldritch Horror came out several years later when Fantasy Flight started implementing this model where they would have a smaller rule book along with a reference guide so that players could refer to some of the more detailed nuances of gameplay and not uh, just bulk it all up in an intimidating package uh, that's hard to navigate and hard to maneuver. Sometimes the Arkham Horror rule book will suffer from that because we're talking about over 24 pages and all of these rules are very necessary. But it's well organized for its time and it has a good amount of uh, images, illustrations, and diagrams, examples, just like the Eldritch Horror rulebook does. So there's that for rulebooks. Let's get to the actual boards here. And the Arkham Horror game here, as the title indicates... The setting for this is the fictitious town of Arkham, Massachusetts. And that's what you see here on the board. And you have all these different locations. First of all, the board is divided into different uh, street areas. you got French Hill, Miskatonic University, Southside, Rivertown, Merchant District, Easttown, Downtown, Northside. And these are basically your neighborhoods, <clears throat> your towns within Arkham. And all of these different locations, which represent graveyards and police stations and administration buildings and hospitals and science buildings and different shops where players can purchase items and stuff. Uh, you even got a church here uh, on the south side. You got Arkham Asylum on the north and the bank. So you have all of this and you have your roads here, which connect uh, the different locations to one another. So that for players to move to one location to another, they're going to have to go through a legal pathway. Over here on the right side of the board, you have your different gates. So that's one main difference uh, from the board is that you have this representation of the actual other world, uh, the other worlds that players are going to be competing against. The other worlds from which monsters and uh, elder ones are going to be uh, springing forth and the investigators are all racing against the clock and against time in order to close these portals in order to close these gates however in the eldritch horror board uh this has a larger scope first of all so we don't we're not dealing with just one town in massachusetts instead we're dealing with the entire world so the board consists of a map of the entire globe here and there is no representation of the gates or the portals 
The gates are simply represented by a token that you will place <clears throat> on the different cities or the different um, locations on which they're opened in, which is uh, going to happen in Arkham Horror as well. You are going to put gate portals or gate tokens on the different locations. But again, you have this representation here, and I'll explain more about why this is necessary for Arkham Horror. And El Jachari here has a bunch of different pathways. What El Jachari introduces here is different types or modes of transportation. So you have your uh, railways, which require one type of transportation. You have your sea paths, and then you have your wilderness paths with these uh, dotted, dotted yellow lines. And all right, so you got the white for the uh, sea paths, you got the railways or train paths with the red. And players are accruing travel tickets that they will be using to speed up the process of traveling, in particular in those two modes of transportation, the trains and in the uh, ships. So there's that. Uh, movement is a lot slower in Eldritch Horror. And again, I'll explain more as to why that works. Eldritch Horror is a much slower game as far as movement is concerned. You cannot move very much typically you're only allowed one free movement per turn unless you use these travel tickets and you can never save more than up to two travel tickets at a time that means you're never going to move more than three spaces at a time quite often for the most part you're going to be moving one or two spaces from turn to turn uh so there's that okay so that's the map or the boards uh, this here also includes a terror track, which is kind of like a ticking time bomb alongside the different gates where once the terror track advances to 10, all hell is going to break loose and those monsters are going to ravage the city. It doesn't necessarily mean that players are going to lose, but things are going to get pretty overwhelming after that. <clears throat> okay, so there's that. Those are the boards. Now let's move on to other components in the game. Got uh, some baggies here to keep the different monsters. And let's just see how the monster tokens compare to one another. So the monster tokens are pretty similar in the sense that they are squared shape. I even believe that perhaps some of the artwork even is copied or borrowed. Re reused, recycled, and it is. Here you got the cultists. On the left here, you have the cultists for the Eldritch Horror game. And on the right here, you have the cultists for the Arkham Horror game. Recycled artwork. Um, similar uh, design as far as how the tiles look. They both have information on the front and information on the back. And uh, you see its health here. The cultist here is dependent on the ancient one. The ancient one will determine the cultist's stats as opposed to in Arkham Horror where the cultist will always have the same stats. And one really cool thing, first of all, uh, this uh, token here, that symbol, that crescent moon, there's a bunch of different symbols in Arkham Horror. And one of the things that happens in Arkham Horror with the monsters that does not happen in Eldritch Horror is that the monsters are constantly moving. In Eldritch Horror, every so often, there is something that triggers the movement of a monster. Quite often, it's their first appearance. They appear in such and such gate, but really, you got to immediately move them to Africa or Asia or whatever it is. But... Uh, in the case of Arkham Horror, throughout the game, you're going to be flipping over Mythos cards that, among other things, are going to determine which types of monsters move and where they're going to move to. And it's a very interesting uh, methodical system here because in Arkham Horror, if you look at the board, you have the different pathways here and you have black and white arrows and based on what mythos card you draw and what uh, different symbol types you might find, triangles, circles, you're going to move those monsters uh, along the pathways that correspond with either a black or white arrow, depending on what the mythos card says. So that's really cool. You always got to kind of account for where the monsters are because the monsters... Uh, 
in Arkham Horror and in Eldritch Horror both kind of serve as a buffer to the ultimate objective of closing the gates, but in different ways. In Eldritch Horror, a player cannot close a gate until they've had an encounter with a monster and eliminate that monster, uh, ideally by defeating it. However, in Arkham Horror, you do not need to uh, defeat a monster at a location that has a gate or a portal in order to close that portal. But when you're moving along the pathways in Arkham Horror, there is the potential that monsters along the way can stop your movement. They can stop your movement right then and right there and you will do no more moving for that turn. So that's something to consider. As a matter of fact, in Arkham Horror, you have this skill check referred to as an evade check, where you will test the awareness, uh, you'll test your evasiveness or your sneakiness, as the game refers to it, compared to the awareness stat of a particular monster. And each monster has an awareness stat on the upper right-hand corner, which serves as a modifier in which, which you will apply to whatever you end up rolling when you do that skill check. So when you're rolling to evade these monsters, if you successfully pass that skill check, you can continue your movement, or at the very least, avoid conflict with that monster right then and there. Because if you end your space, uh, or you end your move in a space with a monster, then you're going to have to engage in conflict uh, immediately. In Eldritch Horror, you can move through monsters if you wish. If a monster is in one location that just happens to be along the way, you can bypass that monster and go to the next location. So again, they serve as buffers uh, to your ultimate objectives, but in different ways. Uh, so those are the monster tokens here. I'll just uh, put them away. Lots of similarities with lots of the components, uh, the components that are used uh, to track health and sanity there's two type of um two type of health indicators in this game you have stamina which is your physical health represented by these red hearts and you have sanity which is your mental health represented by these blue tokens here and the tokens are very very similar looking uh in both games the colors might be a little bit more vibrant in the more recent and new uh, Eldritch Horror, which I just showed off. Very similar tokens as far as uh, these uh, magnifying glasses as search tokens that you have in the game. Now, a very interesting thing about the clue tokens, I should say, and the way they work in Arkham Horror versus Eldritch Horror. So... In Eldritch Horror, the clue tokens are much more valuable, I would say. Many of the mysteries that you utilize, that you do in, um, in Eldritch Horror, require you to spend clue tokens. And the mysteries are basically the objectives. Each Elder One in Eldritch Horror comes with mystery cards. And you're always going to have to complete three of those mystery cards, three of those objectives, if you will, in order to win the game. You don't necessarily need to close all the gates, although you want to hold the gates back so that the uh, Doom Track does not advance all the way and the Elder One does not end up penetrating and entering our reality. Now, in Arkham Horror, you do want to close those gates. Or at the very least, get rid of all the monsters. If you get rid of all the monsters, that's another way of winning the game. These clue tokens are valuable in uh, Arkham Horror for a different reason. They're not necessarily tied in to the ultimate objective. Instead, in Arkham Horror, what they do is they allow for players, when closing a gate, to spend clue tokens as a currency in order to seal a gate. And in Ar Arkham Horror, there's a distinction between sealing a gate and closing a gate. And if you seal a gate, then that location is permanently immune from spawning new gates, new portals. So that's the advantage. You want to seal them because it gives you that advantage as far as not having uh, any more gates open up then and there. 
Uh, you don't necessarily need to seal them in order to accomplish your end game condition as long as you close the prerequisite, the quota for the different gates, you still win the game whether they're sealed or not. But that could be a very useful thing. Also, there's elder sign cards that you can use in order to seal a gate without having to spend clue tokens. So there's other ways of accomplishing that. So again, the clue tokens, not quite as valuable, while in Eldritch Horror, they're much more valuable. Also, Eldritch Horror, a clue token can spawn anywhere. As a matter of fact, on the reverse side of each clue token, you have a different location corresponding with one of the different locations or all of the different locations that you find on the map. Uh, you do not have that in, in uh, Arkham Horror. All of the clue tokens are going to spawn in one of the 11 hot spots on the board. There's lots of locations on the board, but 11 of them in particular are where the gates are going to be opening and they're going to be where the clue tokens are going to be spawning. Every time a uh, gate spawns in a location that already has clue tokens, all those clue tokens are going to be removed. So players want to kind of move as quick as possible to those clue tokens. N another thing that you can use these clue tokens for is for modifiers as far as dice rolling, mitigating your dice rolling. But they're done in two different ways. For example, in Eldritch Harbor, you can spend a clue token in order to re-roll a die that you've already rolled and were not satisfied with its outcome. However, in um, Arkham Horror, you spend the clue token, but the clue token does not make you re-roll. Instead, the clue token will add one to whatever stat or attribute you're having a skill check in, whether it's combat or whether or not it's your um, willpower or whatever other relevant stat to your particular skill check, your luck or what have you. You're going to add one to whatever that stat is. And then you're going to factor in all other uh, modifiers. And that's how many dice you're going to roll. Because in both of these games, your stats, what they tell you, is how many dice you roll. So you have four strength. Then you get to roll four dice every time you make a strength check or a combat check. If you have three willpower, every time you make a willpower check, you're going to roll three dice. So this here is going to allow you to add to those uh, amount of dice. The cool thing about the clue tokens in Arkham Horror is that if for whatever reason your stat is reduced to zero or even negative one, negative two, after all other modifiers have been applied, if you spend a clue token, that clue token will guarantee you one die, no matter what your modified stat is after all modifiers have been applied. So that's pretty cool. And that's it as far as clue tokens. Let's put these away. Um, let's look at the character sheets. And both of these games come with a good amount of character sheets. Here in Eldritch Horror, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12 different characters. And the cool thing about Eldritch Horror is that unlike Elder Sign and some of the earlier releases for the Arkham Horror file line of games, Eldritch Horror went with 12 totally unique characters that are not found in Arkham Horror's uh, supply of, of uh, investigators. Unlike Elder Sign, where all of the characters in Elder Sign are found already in Arkham Horror. So we found 12 investigators here in Eldritch Horror. In Arkham Horror, we got Joe Diamond. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 characters. So Arkham Horror is a little bit more generous as far as uh, the amount of characters. And I think that's going to be a little bit of an overlying theme. You're going to see that um, in other aspects of the components. That Arkham Horror is a little bit more gen generous. It's kind of a product of its time. It's from the early to mid 2000s. Where Fantasy Flight was really packing their games with lots of components. And lots of content. Um, but let's look at the character sheets. First of all, I do like the design, the graphic design on the uh, Eldritch Horror characters more. Uh, the character sheets here in Arkham Horror a little bit more plain. But you see the same stat here, the stamina and the uh, sanity. And it's represented here just in words. 
And basically, uh, some of the differences between artistic style is the different stats. So both uh, Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror, they both include some similar stats. They both include a strength stat. Here it's referred to as fight in Arkham Horror. Uh, they both include a will stat in... Uh, Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror, they both include a lore stat. Now, this is where the differences lie. There is a influence stat in Eldritch Horror that's not found in, in Arkham Horror. Because in Eldritch Horror, players are going to be using their influence stat to roll dice. And that will determine how much money they have whenever they want to go shopping. In Arkham Horror, instead, players are actually going to be dealing with cash, money as a currency. I find that to be neat. It's a little bit hard to mitigate because sometimes you're put in a position where you have no money and you're forced to go to the bank and the bank is only one location in town and it might be far away from where you're at. There are other ways of getting money, taking loans even, but thematically speaking, I like the idea of the cash from a practical, mechanical perspective. This is much more streamlined and player friendly. The influence mechanism here in Eldritch Horror where you roll dice and you just hope that you can roll enough to get it. Uh, most of the items you buy in Eldritch Horror are worth anywhere from one to four uh, dollars, if you will. So you've got a really good chance of affording a chunk of that stuff. Um, so there's that. We have an observation stat here in uh, Eldritch Horror that's not found in Arkham Horror. And in Arkham Horror, first of all, we have this luck stat. So there are certain skill checks that are going to relate to luck, and that makes sense. And it also has these two stats here, the speed and the sneak stat, which are not found in Eldritch Horror. Because in Eldritch Horror, by default... Characters only move one space per turn, or can move up to one space per turn. They can actually move theoretically two or three if they've saved up enough tickets for travel. Here, in Arkham Horror, the character is going to move based on their speed. And this is an additional way of distinguishing characters from one another, because some characters are faster than the others, and therefore are going to be able to cover much more terrain. I like that idea. I like the idea of managing it. Now... At the beginning of each Arkham Horror round, you have this phase in which you are allowed to adjust your um, your stats. That's really cool. You basically put a clip or an indicator. Uh, I'm not sure where I have them. Okay, they're right here. And this basically indicates where your current stat is. And each stat here is lumped up in two. So your speed and your sneak are... Are lumped up together, one on the top and one on the bottom. Same thing with your fight and your will, and same thing finally with your lore and your luck. And sometimes you're gonna have really good sneak, perhaps, but very low speed, or you can have it somewhere in the middle. Same thing with fight and will and lore and luck. But at the beginning of each round, you can make some stat adjustments. You could slide these along the way to prepare for the upcoming turn and the decisions that you're anticipating that you will make. Now, each player has a focus stat. So in this case, uh, Monterey Jack here has a focus stat of two. That's not a stat that you'll find in Eldritch Horror. And what this focus stat tells you is that at the beginning of each round, when you make your uh, shifts, your adjustments, your stat adjustments, you can move two slots along the way combined in all your places. So you can move, let's say, one over here. And let's say another one somewhere else. Or you can move this guy two spots for your two focus there. So you're limited. You have that freedom of being able, being able to adjust your stats. But you're limited to your character's focus, right? So I find that to be really cool, really neat. It adds an additional element of decision making. Which at the same time, the argument can be made that it adds a little bit to the complexity of the game. Because even before the main phase or main... Um, uh, part of the hero's turns when the investigator's turns even before that happens players are kind of like thinking about these really crucial decisions that they have to make as far as adjusting stats uh so it, it all it's all a matter of how you feel about time if you mind a longer game as you will see with lots of the different 
um, nuances of Arkham Horror. It is a longer experience. Um, so there's that. We had the different stats. I think that's really cool that you get to adjust them. Uh, each character starts in a different location. And that's the same for both Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror, which adds an another element of tactical uh, gameplay here. Where do you want to start? Uh, you probably want to start, if you're playing with a group of players, maybe cover as much land as possible. So choose your characters accordingly. Each character also starts with some starting items. I find that Arkham Horror uh, starts with more starting items. Typically, the characters, the investigators, start with more starting items than in Eldritch Horror. And I think one of the reasons why is because um, Arkham Horror from the start is a little bit more difficult than Eldritch Horror. So that's a way of balancing that out. Uh, characters usually have some special abilities, which you'll find in both games here. Now, a really cool thing uh, in, this, in these two games is how they handle um, death and dying, or character elimination, if you will. In Eldritch Horror, the characters have two health stats, your stamina and your sanity. If either one of these stats is reduced to zero, the character is eliminated, and the back of the card gives you an explanation for their elimination, whether it was through physical uh, combat or whether it was through going insane. And what happens is you will leave the character's uh, token on the location on the map where they were eliminated. You will leave all of their items and their clue tokens. These are items that could be reclaimed by another investigator if they make it to that same location and if they have their encounter. There's an actual written encounters with skill checks and all on the back of each character sheet depending on whether it's a stamina elimination or a, um, a, a sanity elimination. And if the players successfully pass these skill checks, then they could retrieve those items, those weapons, those spells, and those uh, clue tokens, and keep it for themselves. So that's a good way of not losing that progress, because it could be very frustrating if you build up one character very strong, and they end up getting eliminated. Also, the player, the human player, is not eliminated from the game. The human player actually just goes and replaces their character with a new one. In Arkham Horror, it's a little bit more generous in that regard, which is also why you find larger discrepancies between characters' sanities and stamina stats. Because in Arkham Horror, what happens is, if a character ever loses all of their sanity, they are going to simply go to Arkham Asylum and um, slowly build their strength back up. Uh, they'll lose whatever progress in the location they may have been in. If they were trying to close a gate, that will be undone. And they'll be sent to Arkham Asylum no matter how far away from the board that is. If a character, but, the, but very important, the character is not eliminated. They're still in contention. They're still in play. The, if the character ever loses all their stamina, they will be sent back to St. Mary's Hospital, another location on the opposite side of town, and they'll immediately retreat, uh, recover one health. And again, they'll lose whatever progress they had made towards closing gates and portals and what have you, but they'll still be in the game. The only way a character can ever be eliminated is if they are devoured. And to be devoured, you need to have both your sanity and your stamina reduced to zero at the same time. Now, just like in Eldritch Horror, although the character is eliminated from the game, the player is not, and they can draw a new card from the character cards and start from scratch in their starting location. So there's that as far as characters uh, are concerned. Now, let's talk a little bit about the different Elder Ones that you find in Arkham Horror versus Eldritch Horror. So, first of all, in uh, Eldritch Horror, we have Yog satoth and I'm not the greatest at pronouncing these names. I don't know who is. We have Cthulhu, which I'm still not sure if that's the correct pronunciation, but that's how everybody else says it, right? Cthulhu. Uh, we have Azatoth here, and we have Shub Niggurath. And these are the only four Elder Ones. It's actually 
pretty meager. They're all really cool, really interesting, and really challenging in their own different diverse ways. But yes, there's only four Elder Ones, four bosses that the base game comes with. Now, Arkham Horror, as I mentioned earlier, the common reoccurring theme is that Arkham Horror is going to be way more generous with the content. You've got Yig here. You've got Ithaqua. You've got Niar Lathotep. You have Haster here. You have Cthulhu again. You have to have Cthulhu. Uh, you have Shub Niggurath again. And you have Yogg Satoth again. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ancient ones. That's almost double the amount. So that is a pretty generous uh, supply as far as the different uh, Elder Ones are concerned. And there's some differences as far as how the Elder Ones work. We have the uh, Doom Tokens here that are on the very card of the Elder One for Arkham Horror. Uh, in Elder Charter, instead we have a Doom Track that's actually printed on the board. But it's a very similar concept where different Elder Ones are going to have different uh, starting spots or different thresholds for the amount of doom that triggers their either their coming or the ending of the game. So based on what Elder One you'll have, that will give you the starting spot for your doom track, which will advance throughout the game. And in Elder Charter, your doom for the most part, advances whenever you um, advance in this omen track that's on the upper right-hand corner. And it has four different uh, spots here with three different colors corresponding to, to the three different types of gates that you'll find in this game. And whenever the omen track advances to a spot that the color matches uh, gates, uh, the colors of the gates in the, in the board for each color, for each gate that matches that color, you're going to advance the Doom Track. So you want to keep those gates under control. In Arkham Horror, the way that Doom advances is that every time a new gate is spawned, you're going to add a Doom token onto that current Elder One's uh, Doom Track. So if whenever we uh, trigger the uh, drawing of new portals, new gates... You might draw a gate in a location that already has a gate. Therefore, you do not add a new gate. You just simply trigger a monster surge, which lots of monsters will get on the board. They'll be spawned on the board. And that'll be tr trouble in a different way. But every time you open a gate in a location that did not have a gate already, then you're going to advance in this Doom Track. Now, the cool thing about this game is if you ever use uh, an Elder Sign token or an Elder Sign card, I should say, not only do you get to remove the Doom Track, uh, one of the tokens from the Doom Track, but the reverse side of the Doom Token is the Elder Sign, and you basically place this uh, on top of the location uh, in which you just play the Elder Sign, indicating that that location is permanently sealed and no more gates can spawn there. So <clears throat> there's that. So yeah, there's two similar yet different ways of managing the Doom Track. Now, both of these games come with tons and tons of different cards here. And the cards, first of all, you have cards representing the different um, items that the characters can have. And both of them, for the item cards and such, they follow uh, similar uh, concepts as far as the size is concerned. All the items and things like that are going to be smaller uh, mini USA style cards here and for the most part you have all the items lumped up into one deck of cards here and then you have a few other a few other decks of cards you have some artifacts those are a separate deck of cards you have a separate deck here for spells and then you have a bunch of conditions both of these games have tons of conditions ranging anywhere from blessed to cursed uh, in Arkham Horror, the items are divided into different categories. So, you have skills, and you have um, allies. These represent allies, different allies, like Ruby Standish 
and Ryan Dean and Thomas F. Malone. Uh, what else do you have? You have your yellow back cards here, which are your common items, right? You've got dynamite. Don't know how common that is. You got ancient tome. You got food. You've got a dark cloak. You've got a motorcycle. So you got your common items here. Uh, you have your spells, which are another separate deck here. And then finally, you have your unique items, which are probably your most powerful deck of cards. And it's within this deck that you'll find the different Elder Sign cards that are all very valuable. So you have something like your Silver Key. You've got uh, your Holy Water. You've got the King in Yellow Tome. You've got the Lamp of Alhazred. So you've got all these items broken down into different types. So an Eldritch Horror, first of all, you have a meager, much more meager array of items here in Eldritch Horror. Uh, any one of these stacks of cards, is, except for maybe the allies here, are just as big, if not bigger, than the total of items you find in Eldritch Horror. But you do have a few more items here with the artifacts in Eldritch Horror. And of course, you have this little group of spells here. But what's interesting about Arkham Horror is that by dividing these cards into all these different types, they actually make the game a little bit more tactical because the locations on the board kind of correspond with the different items you can get. So, for example, if you want to go to a spell, if you want to get a spell, you're going to have to go to a very particular spot on the board. And you might be very far away. So it might be several turns down the road, or you might not even want to go there. You might just focus your game in another direction. Same thing with your unique items and your common items and your skills and your, and your allies. Quite often, you're going to have to go to very specific locations on the board in order to acquire these different items. So that in and of itself creates another layer of challenge and tactics and strategy and mapping out your turns, short-term and long-term, in order to get the correct uh, things. Uh, now, your skills, quite often what they do, your skill cards here, is that they will add to your relevant stats. So these are like permanent modifiers to increase the amount of dice you roll for particular skill checks. Eldritch Horror accomplishes that through a simple leveling up system where you will grant, get one of these tokens here. You'll get one of these tokens here that modifies a particular stat. You put it next to your character sheet as a reminder that that stat has been permanently modified. And in Eldritch Horror, you know which spots on the board are more likely to influence one attribute versus another. So just like in Arkham Horror, you have these different locations that are prone to help you in certain categories. The only thing is that in Eldritch Horror, it's not a guarantee. While a location tells you that it's very helpful for you to get ritual spells, or another location tells you it's very good for you to increase your observation, it doesn't mean that the encounters you'll be having in those locations are guaranteed to help you in those areas, but the probability, the likelihood is that those will be the areas where you uh, can be benefited from. So it's a little bit of a, of a game of chance as far as Eldritch Horror is concerned. So there's that. So these are basically the different uh, item cards that you have in uh, these different games. Now let's talk a little bit about the encounter cards. So both of these games are very encounter driven. You're going to make it to different locations in the board. And towards the end or after your turn, you're going to have some type of encounter phase where you'll be drawing a random card from that location or applicable to that location and you'll be resolving it. Now, in Arkham, in Eldritch Horror, a fight, a combat is considered an encounter and is relegated or saved to the encounter phase in a player's turn. While in Arkham Horror... Players are going to be combating or fighting monsters as they, inc as they cross their paths in movement. In Eldritch Horror, once you've completed, if you've successfully defeated a monster in your first step of encounter, let's say, 
If you successfully defeated that monster, then you'll be able to actually have an encounter with that location, whether it's a research encounter where you're trying to uh, gain clue tokens through doing so, or it's a location-based encounter, or perhaps if you're in a location that has a gate, it's an other world encounter in order to hopefully close the gates. Now, real quick, I've brought it up. The uh, research encounters are the ways that you uh, get these clue tokens. I mentioned the clue tokens in detail earlier and how much more beneficial they are in Eldritch Horror, how much more crucial and necessary they are in Eldritch Horror. And because they're so much more necessary in Eldritch Horror, that's the reason why Eldritch Horror makes it a little bit more of a challenge in order to acquire these clue tokens. In Arkham Horror, you simply need to enter a space that has these clue tokens, and your investigator will pick them up. In Eldritch Horror, you have to have an encounter. You will draw a card from the Research Encounter deck, and the card will walk you through a series of narratives and also some skill checks that you have to partake in. And if you successfully accomplish those skill checks, then you'll be able to gain the clue token in that location. And chances are there's only... Uh, as a matter of fact, there's only going to be one locate, one clue token per encounter. So you're never going to just grab a whole bunch of clue tokens in Eldritch Horror as you would in Arkham Horror. But there's a reason why, because it's so much more tied in to the objectives and goals of the game. So there's that. So you got all these different uh, locations in which you're going to be having encounters. And basically, in Eldritch Horror, you have encounters based on the location you're in. And they actually... Um, divide it into broad general locations. So first of all, uh, let's look at all these cards here. First of all, we have we have the three main continents that are represented. We have the uh, or sides of the map. We have North and South America, which are represented by this green deck of cards. You've got uh, Europe represented by these orange deck of cards. And um, you've got uh, Asia here represented by these purple deck of cards. And when you flip over a card, based on one of the cities that you're in, you're going to see which city you're in. And you're going to read the narrative and resolve the skill check for that city in order to accomplish that encounter successfully. However, if you're not in one of the main cities on a continent on one of these three continents, then you're simply going to draw from this generic location uh, stack here. And depending on whether you're in a city, a wilderness space, or a sea space, which all corresponds to particular symbols on the board, that will determine which of these encounters you're going to read and resolve. Now, something really interesting that Eldritch Horror adds is this expedition uh, location deck and you have this expedition token that will be moving throughout the board and it basically just grants players an additional opportunity for a positive encounter you would read this card you would see the narrative resolve it and basically determine whether or not you succeeded and quite often you have a very good beneficial reward uh, awaiting you afterward and then finally here we have the encounter the other world encounters and here, basically, we're going to uh, flip over one of these cards. Whether you're in a city, a wilderness, or a sea space again, you're going to resolve the corresponding text, uh, resolve the skill checks, and see whether or not you were successful at closing those gates. Now, Arkham Horror breaks it down even further, I find, because they have so many different sections on the board, so many different neighborhoods, street areas and when for each of those locations they have a corresponding color and their own uh deck of cards and depending on the area you're in you'll flip over one of these cards and you will have uh you'll flip over this card and you'll see if you're in that location and if you're in that location you resolve its uh, narrative and perhaps skill checks that need to take place and see if you were successful with that encounter and what the reward for that encounter would be. Now, what's interesting about Arkham Horror versus Eldritch Horror is that you kind of have these in-between spots in Arkham Horror 
these locations. So right here where it says East Town or where it says Downtown, these are active legal locations in which players and um, monsters can reside for the, for the time being. However, these, these locations do not have encounters. Every location, every spot in Eldritch Horror has an encounter. So if you're stuck in one of these spots, unfortunately for you, you're not going to have an encounter. And that feels a little bit boring in a way. But at the same time, it could be a little bit safe. Because sometimes these encounters, especially if you fail at them, have some detrimental effects that you might want to avoid. So that's something to keep in mind. But we have tons of these decks of cards for all the different locations. Uh, and you have your other world. You have your other world um encounters as well depending on the particular world you're in unlike uh eldritch horror in eldritch horror a player does not find what other world a gate leads into until they draw from the other world deck and then they'll say oh this gate leads to you goth here and then they read the text and resolve it but there is nothing on the board or on the tokens that tells you what uh location it is However, when you are uh, doing your gates here, your portals in Arkham Horror, they actually tell you what other world it leads to. And based on that, the investigators are going to have to physically travel through that world. So that's a really cool, interesting thematic element. It makes the game a little bit slower because you have to waste two turns once you go to a location that has a gate. You have to waste at least two turns or invest two turns to go through each of these two spots. There's always two spaces that you have to advance through in each other world before you can even go back to the original location and attempt to close it. So that's something to keep in mind. It makes the game drag out a little bit. It makes it feel a little bit longer. But at the same time, it is thematic. You kind of have to immerse yourself and go through that world, see what's on the other side before you have the knowledge, the strength, and the wisdom to come back and close it. Uh, so there's that. So you know which world each of these gates lead to right from the very get-go. All right, so there's that. I feel like that's pretty much it. I think we're just going to go and hear my final thoughts as to what I think about these two amazing games. So what are my final comparisons on Eldritch Horror and Arkham Harbor? We're going to break it down into a couple of categories. First, let's start with artwork. And while I mentioned earlier that lots of the images have been recycled from one game towards the other, and as a matter of fact, for most of the Arkham Horror file line of games, a lot of that artwork has been recycled and reused, and it's very good artwork. But I'm going to have to give the edge to Arkham Horror in particular because of the board. There's something about the board for Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. The old rustic look of it really gets me into that Lovecraftian Cthulhu theme more than Eldritch Horror. Sometimes I look at the Eldritch Horror map and I feel like I'm playing a game of Ticket to Ride, right? You have all of these different... Uh, countries and cities around the world and their different continents connected by different paths and routes. Arkham Horror gives me more of that feel. Uh, so I'm going to have to give the edge for artwork to Arkham Horror because of that. Now let's talk about content and variety. And again, I'm going to have to give the nod to Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. Uh, a lot of it is based on the company's philosophy at the time. Uh, Fantasy Flight Games would jam-pack their games with tons of content. Be really hard to like close the, the lids back on the boxes. Eldritch Horror, it offers a good amount of content. You got 12 investigators and you have four different elder ones. However, Arkham Horror adds even more it offers even more variety to the product you have 16 investigators you have seven elder ones and on top of it all you have more locations with more encounter cards you have a truckload more of different item cards yes some of them are repeated uh, or they're duplicates but it's still more items and spells that you would find in eldritch horror and i have to give it credit for that now let's talk about expansions uh, when you get into a good game, you really want to know if there's expansion content to enhance that variability and replayability. And I'm going to give these games a tie. Both of these games, I believe, have seven expansions. It might be that Eldritch Horror has eight, but it's comparable. 
They have a good amount of big box expansions and then a few smaller box expansions. I, I think Eldritch Horror might have one more smaller box expansion that Arkham Horror has. And these expansions add more Elder Ones, more Investigators, but not only that, they also add additional mechanisms that enhance the gameplay. So if you enjoy these systems of games, you can explore that expansion content in order to continue getting it to the table. Now let's talk about theme. These games are both very thematic. And when I want to have an immersive thematic gameplay experience, quite often these are the games I turn to. Again, I'm going to have to give the slight edge to Arkham Horror. There are some things that Arkham Horror introduces to the game that enhances the thematic ambiance, albeit sometimes in expense or in exchange for game length, right? Sometimes the time or the game length suffers because of the thematic experience. For example, we have the Terra Track, which I mentioned earlier. It's on the board at the bottom. That adds an additional element of uh, terror, right? As the word indicates. In both games, you have to account for the Doom Tracks. But this terror track is an additional uh, track that we have to kind of mitigate and hold back because if not, then the influx of monsters is going to come because what the game has is it controls the monsters early on in the game by giving the actual city of Arkham a, a limit as to how many monsters can be in the city at once and the monsters that cannot fit in the city remain in the outskirts. But eventually, once the terror track makes it to that ultimate threshold, there is no monster limit and all of a sudden, you're going to have all this chaos ensuing and it's going to be very hard for the investigators to keep track. But it buys you some time. Along the way, as the track advances, advances the terror track that is you're going to have different shops that are going to close down and those are going to be locations that you'll no longer no longer be able to frequent and purchase items and spells from so that's something to factor in as well um i love the fact that you go through the gates you actually have to go and be sucked into the portal and spend some time there before you can come back to our reality to our dimension and close those gates as i mentioned er earlier in the comparison part of the video you have uh, this adds some time because you have to wait at least two turns. Sometimes you might have an encounter in the other world that actually speeds up the process and brings you back to our dimension quicker. But more often than not, you're going to spend at least two turns waiting before you can even attempt a closed gate. And you might fail for all you know. And if you fail, you're going to be kind of... Uh, put in a tight situation where we're going to have to remain in that location because if you leave in that location and go back, then you undo your progress and you have to go through that gate all over again and invest two more turns. So this makes it very thematic, but it adds to the game length because that's two more turns for every gate that you're trying to close around the table. Uh, I love the fact that when characters uh go insane they go to arkham asylum i find that to be a really cool and neat part and the encounter cards in arkham horror they seem a little bit more thematic and immersive while i must admit that the narration in eldritch horror is probably a little bit better so there's that for theme i'm gonna give it to arkham horror second edition now let's talk about gameplay which at the end of the day these are board games and perhaps this is the most important category of all and for gameplay i will give the nod to Eldritch Horror. I think both of these games play just fine, but for lots of the reasons that I already mentioned, mostly time-related reasons, uh, Eldritch Horror is superior to Arkham Horror. First of all, there's a lot of streamlining that took place in Eldritch Horror. It's a newer system. It's a response to the older system, and it's a way of expanding the horizons for other players to play these type of games. Uh, instead of having a bunch of different phases for your turn, the way Arkham Horror has it, a much more complex turn structure. In Eldritch Horror, you basically have one main phase, you have a couple other phases, but you have one main phase in which you have a pool of several actions that you can choose from, but the game streamlines things by only allowing you to do two of those things. And quite often, you can't even do all of those things, and you can never do any of those things more than once. So all of that kind of limits you. You don't really have that much choice to some extent in certain situations uh and some people might feel 
like that strips the game of its beauty, not having that many options and choices as you might have in Arkham Horror. But that also speeds up the decision making process because quite often you're picking from two actions and you might only have two actions to pick from in that current situation. Uh, influence helps with uh, shopping. In this game, you have your influence stat, which is how you shop. So as long as you have an influence stat and you hopefully increase your influence stat or modify your influence, influence stat, you're always going to be able to go to shop and roll dice as long as you're in a city location and not every location in the board is a city, but the majority of them are. As long as you're in a city location, you'll be able to shop for these items. In Arkham Horror, quite often you are forced or limited in your shopping uh, endeavors because you might not have the money currency that's required and you might not be able to get to the location the particular locations in which you have to be in order to purchase these items. So that's something to consider. They sped up the process. I don't have to race across town in order to go to such and such shop or maybe go to the bank in order to get some money so then I could go to that shop. No, you have all of this at your disposal because of all those city locations that are splattered throughout the board and also because your influence skill check always gives you the uh, potential of generating some money. Uh, monsters do not impede movement in Eldritch Horror. Again, that adds to the streamlined nature. Quite often, a lot of this game is maneuvering and trying to get to different locations. If a monster happens to be in your way, yes, that monster might limit the actions you can take in a location. They might not allow you to uh, rest. They might not allow you to shop in that location, but you can move through that monster. Now, in Arkham Horror, monsters quite often are going to intervene and prevent continuing your movement. You do have the ability to evade them through an evasion uh, skill check. However, quite often you're going to fa fail at those evade checks and you're going to be stuck and they're going to stop your movement and hinder you from getting to your destination. So again, that it, that elongates the gameplay process because you want to get from point A and point to point B. And although you have these speed stats that give you the uh, illusion of being able to maneuver and move as fast as possible, those monsters quite often are going to get in your way. Now your Mythos deck is another way that Eldritch Horror both streamlines and shortens the game by limiting the amount of Mythos cards that are in each game. So basically the Elder one at the beginning of each game is going to determine how many Mythos cards are going to be in the Mythos deck and how many of the different types of Mythos cards are going to configure that deck. In Arkham Horror, you just have a endless, limitless a mythos deck to run through and the mythos deck and the end of the game have no correla correlation. The game ends when the game ends. In Eldritch Horror, among many other time or end game triggers, you have that mythos deck. If that mythos deck runs out, the game is over. Quite often as a player, you're going to be on the losing side of the effort and you're going to wish you had more time but it forces you, it confines the gameplay experience to a limited time and therefore makes the game, uh, by obligation, it makes it a shorter experience. Now, it's still a longer game. This game is still about a two-hour, two-hour-plus experience. But it's not going to hit the three-hour-plus or sometimes even four-hour-plus range that Arkham Horror might occasionally do. So I have to commend it for that. Uh, character Elimination works so different. While in Arkham Horror, it's more difficult to be eliminated. If a character is eliminated, that really sucks for the team. It sucks for the investigators because that character is going to be gone. And yes, the human player can still play and they can get a new character, but they're going to have to start from scratch. In Eldritch Horror, if your character dies by either sanity or by... Um, by a uh, stamina they are not devoured so they don't undo all their character cards but they are eliminated but you do get to put their um their acquired assets and their clue tokens and their artifacts you get to put them in the location in which they were eliminated on and a future player or another player in a future turn can make it to that location have an encounter and potentially regain all of those items therefore not losing the progress and keeping the game flow going on strong so for all of those reasons i'm going to say that gameplay is definitely going to go to eldritch horror and finally which game am i going to give it to overall i'm going to have to say that it's eldritch horror and while i chose arkham horror for lots of the categories 
And maybe in this alternate reality where I didn't care much as much about time and the people I gained with didn't care about uh, time as much, maybe I would pick Arkham Horror. But I live in the world that I live in, and because of that, I have to pick Eldritch Horror. Eldritch Horror, the gameplay is smoother, quicker, much more streamlined. Uh, lots of the good things that Arkham Horror does, Eldritch Horror, Horror does as well. I do like having both of these games in my collection, and every so often, I will get Arkham Horror to the table instead of Eldritch Horror. But I'm definitely going to play this game more times in a year, let's say, than Arkham Horror will, because, again, the short gameplay. And the people that I play with, although I play both of these games solo, occasionally, um, eh, quite often, actually, uh, the people that I game with are even more picky about time than i am so therefore this is the game to take to put on the table when i want to play cooperatively so overall my uh choice of the two eldritch Horror. and that's it for today's comparison video please comment down below tell me what you guys think about these two games perhaps you played one or the other perhaps you haven't played either and you are interested uh, in seeing which one you want to acquire. I will warn that Arkham Horror is long out of print, second edition at least, third edition is still going. So you're going to have to really scavenge to find a copy at a decent price. And even for a decent price, you're probably going to be paying more for Arkham Horror than you will for Eldritch Horror. But if you know yourself and you know that this is probably the game you would gravitate more towards than perhaps... Uh, it'd be a sacrifice you'd be willing to make. And that's it for today's video, guys. Thank you so much for joining us here. I went Harry at Board Games. This is Harry saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming. Bye-bye.